as Rick mentioned, I graduated from the law school. Um, it was at the University of Manitoba just last spring. And I come back home to Alberta. Alberta is home for me. I'm from the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, which is northwest from here. And I spent a lot of time growing up in Edmonton. I graduated from high school here. And I also started um, post-secondary studies here long time ago um, in journalism and communications at Grant McEwen. So to come back home has been um, an adjustment in many ways, um, but also very nice. And I'm really happy to be here today. So one of the things that um, I needed to think about in preparing thoughts on what I would share with you today and, and how I would share with you today is thinking about what this conference is about. Um, the title of it being about sustainability. So I went on the internet to see what kinds of definitions there were about sustainability, because I know I have my own, but I never actually looked it up to see what it might mean. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that I found because they're very relevant probably to some of the discussions you've been having. And I'm finding that they're very relevant to the work in the impetus that started the whole Idle No More movement. So from Wikipedia, this is what I found that it said, that sustainability is the capacity to endure. It also says, that for humans, sustainability is the potential for long-term maintenance of well-being, which has environmental, economic, and social dimensions. It also says that sustainability interfaces with economics through the social and ecological consequences of economic activity. And further, sustainability economics involves ecological economics where social, cultural, health-related, and monetary financial aspects are integrated. And it says, moving towards sustainability is also a social challenge that entails international and national law. In 1980s, um, sustainability had been used more in the sense of human sustainability on the planet Earth and has resulted in the most wild, widely quoted definition of sustainability as part of the concept sustainable development. It came from the United Nations Brundtland Commission in 1987. The quote says, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And finally, in 2005, the World Summit on Social Development, it was noted that this requires the reconciliation of environmental, social equity, and economic demands, which are also known as the three pillars of sustainability, or the three E's. So that's what I found on Wikipedia and in a few other sources of what sustainability is. And it really made sense to me in so many ways, and in particular, the, the reference to what came out of the UN's uh, commission in 1987, I'll just say that again, is the sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, why I think that's important to say again is because the impetus behind the Idle No More movement and my involvement in it has to do largely with the treaty relationship. And the way that I was taught from my mother is that the treaty was about, in 1899 for me, when Treaty 8 was signed, that the idea was to make sure that there was something for me 100 years ahead. My ancestors were already thinking about me trying to make sure that I still had um, the ability to live my life as a Nihiasquo, which is a Cree woman. So to me, this is what came to mind when I read this about not compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. 
and the kind of thinking where we come from as treaty people, particularly on the prairies and in this area, which is Treaty 6. So this is what has been the foundational teachings all my life of a responsibility and thinking ahead. And, and to me, I think that's what sustainability really is. Not about benefiting from today, but using what you have today, keeping in mind the preservation of it for tomorrow. So that's been all inclusive, in my opinion, of Treaty 8 for me and the rights that it contains in there. And it contains things like um, education, housing, economic development through livelihood, such as hunting, fishing, farming, trapping, agriculture. All of these treaty rights that were set aside for us to sustain us, and also so that we can continue to live our lives as we lived them before the Europeans came to their lands. And that includes identity. And identity has been very key in the last hundred years in what's been able to sustain us thus far, despite the many broken treaty promises. So this is sort of where I don't know more in my participation comes from. What happened for me was uh, last spring, I started to read in the newspaper uh, more and more about something called Bill C-45. And at the time, I couldn't pay much attention to it because I was just finishing my law school and going through exams and, and that kind of thing. So I didn't have much time to pay attention. But when I started to see in the news reports of what contained what was contained in Bill C-45, it was clear that I had to make it a point to start paying attention to what it contained. What I saw were um, two things in particular that were very problematic in terms of our treaty rights and what I felt were issues of sustainability and looking towards the future. One of them had to do with the changes to the Navigable Waters Act and the other has to do with the changes to the Indian Act. Now, part of the dialogue that's been around the changes in these bills have to do with making these changes so we can have economic benefits. That's how they've been being sold to the people in our communities and our leadership. And that all sounds good and great, but really, um, we needed to stop and think at what expense and at whose expense. So what that meant for me was looking, starting to look at the bill because it was 400 pages long and it had over 44 federal laws that would be changed by this particular bill, two of which are the ones that I mentioned. So the effects of the changes of the Navigable Waters Act and the Indian Act result in my mind in the same thing, which is easier access to the lands and to the waters by government or industry. So even though uh, the Navigable Waters Act isn't an environmental protection act per se, it did offer through its processes some forms of protection for bodies of water across the country. And this is one of the key factors of why Bill C-45 should be a concern to every Canadian because it affects every single body of water across the country. What's left is a hundred lakes across the country that still fall within the act. And I think about, oh, I can't remember the number offhand of the rivers, but a few hundred for sure. And in Alberta, what that means for us is the only lake that remains under the Navigable Waters Act is Lake Athabasca and the rivers that remain under that are the Bow River, the Peace River, and the North Saskatchewan River. Mm, I'd have to think of the other two. I think there might be one or two more. But when you think of Alberta, and you can think already, and you're probably thinking, oh, my, my lake is not even on that list. Like for me, Sturgeon Lake is not on the list. Uh, Lesser Slave Lake is not on the list. The Wapiti River that goes through my territories is not on the list. And it's very concerning, especially because of the kind of um, 
resource development that happens in Alberta and the amount of water that's needed to sustain the practices that are engaged in extracting the resources from our lands. So to me, this was really a big problem because suddenly now our waters are more accessible. And I'm wondering when I go home now and I go down by the lake and I see and I feel much concern and wondering how long can I stand here and be able to see a lake and how quickly is it going to start receding now that people have easier access in taking the waters. So the other issue had to do with changes to the Indian Act. And while it affects First Nations people first, because it has to do with reserve lands, it ultimately will affect all Canadians. Because what the changes in the Indian Act through Bill C-45 do is create easier access to First Nations lands. And it has to do with the voting provisions for referendums to designate or surrender lands. So what that really means is if you need to use the lands for different reasons, you have to have a community referendum where the community members will decide if they're going to allow that piece of land to be used for a different purpose. It's similar to zoning in a city in that you have to assign the piece of land particular usage. But for First Nations communities, you have to agree to it through a community referendum. So what the Indian Act changes do is it lowers the threshold of consent through voting in community referendums. So whereas before, it was quite the process to have a community referendum and get the whole community to agree that you want to designate these lands. And now it's not a big process anymore. It is still a process. It still exists. But what changes is the number of people who need to vote in the referendum. So if my community, Sturgeon Lake, said, we're going to have a referendum because we want to build a grain terminal um, on this piece of land. So we're going to have a meeting on March the 7th. So March the 7th comes around under the new rules. If only five Sturgeon Lake members show up to vote, they can vote for the all of the whole community, and that vote would stand. Whereas before, they needed all of the members to vote, and a majority of them had to vote, I think, more than once. So to me, that was really problematic because it opens up the access to our lands. And I think that in light of developments, of, of pipeline developments proposed across the country, um, it's probably likely that many of the communities along the way are ours. So I, I'm thinking that the rules were changed so that they can have easier access to our lands, allowing the pipelines to go through. This is just my own theory. I, I have no evidence or anything to back it up. But when you think about um, the reality that we live in today and the kind of agenda that the Harper government is pushing, um, it kind of really makes sense. So that was why Bill C-45 was a big issue, because it had to do with lands and waters. And to me, I thought that because it had to do with lands and waters, there should be some response. Why aren't our First Nations leadership talking about these issues? This has to do with a very serious land and water question. And I hear nothing from anyone like the Assembly of First Nations or anyone else for that matter. So I finished up law school and I came home and I started to article and I still started to see Bill C-45 in the news a lot. And then I started to pay attention to all of the rest of the legislation that's coming our way such as Bill C-27, which is the Financial Accountability Act, Bill C-428, which is the private member's bill where they're trying to change and replace the Indian Act. And I spent some time looking at those two other pieces of legislation and was very concerned about them as well. Um, in Bill C-27, it's being sold as 
chiefs and councils need to be accountable for their salaries and all the expenses that they have. This has been the whole propaganda of the Harper government for many years, trying to paint all of our First Nations leadership as if they're all corrupt. And we know they're all not. There's nobody in any political system that's free from corruption, but there's also no political structures that are completely filled with corrupt politicians, least of all ours. So the Harper government has been selling Bill C-27 as we need these chiefs and councils to be held accountable, when what they don't talk about is the number of chiefs and councils that have been accountable for many years and have been disclosing this information. So this is one of the aspects of the bill, that it contains these disclosure provisions. That I can't say that I have a problem with. You know, I, I hate the propaganda around the reasons why, but it's something that's okay. But the other part of the bills, I think, are, of that bill are really problematic. And that is some new reporting requirements in there. Not only do chief and councils have to start um, disclosing information of the band expenditures for federal dollars, they're going to be made to disclose all of the expenditures for any band-owned businesses. Now, this is a provision that no other company in the country is subject to, which leads me to the conclusion that this is a racist law. Why is this only applying to Indians? What grounds do they have to think that they can come here in our communities and demand that we make our books open to all of Canadian public for the businesses that have nothing to do with federal dollars. And it really makes me angry because I'm thinking, of course, always, and what does this really mean? You know, what is the real hidden motive behind wanting us to give this information? And it seems to me part of the idea has always been to deal with the Indian problem. And in regards to Bill C-428, it has to do with getting rid of the Indian Act. And it's always been this kind of strange relationship that we have with the Indian Act as First Nations people. On one hand, we loathe it, you know. It controls our lives and keeps us from advancing in ways that we want to advance. But on the other hand, Strangely, it offers some protections to us in many ways. So this is the strange relationship that we continue to have with the Indian Act. So on one hand, yes, we want to get rid of it. But on the other hand, we say, and then what? If we get rid of it, then what do we have left in place? So this is kind of the point of, I think, where we need to start thinking about, in terms of sustainability, as Indigenous people, of what next? And the problem, in particular for me, with Bill C-428, the Indian Act, um, getting rid of it, is some of the language inside of the bill is that it says that other interested parties can have part of the discussion on getting rid of the Indian Act and making changes to it. Other interested parties. So who might other interested parties be? Well, I know, I think of one right away. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation. They think they have business in our affairs because they think that what we get is taxpayers' dollars. Imagine them coming to sit at this table where we're talking about changes to the Indian Act and that they have any authority to talk about it with us. It's not even a process that's going to be designed for us, by us, it's something that's going to be designed by the federal government and anyone else who's interested. So when I started to look at these things and I shake my head and think, wow, we're in big trouble as First Nations people. Uh, and that's not even all of them. There's actually eight or nine pieces of legislation that we're facing. But I mention these ones because one of them, Bill C-45, has come to pass. Bill C-27 is on its way to passing, if not in the next couple of weeks. And Bill C-428 is 
Rob Clark is the member of parliament who's pushing that agenda. Right now, he's going out across the country to talk to people about it. So these are ones that are being aggressively pushed forward as we speak. So back in the fall, um, I started talking with Sylvia McAdam, who I'd met at a conference earlier in the spring. And we were talking about these bills and saying, wow, you know, this is really terrible. What are we going to do about it? What can we do about it? Why isn't our leadership talking about these issues, bringing them up with us, giving us an opportunity to talk about them and make some plans if that's what we decide to do? So she decided that what she was going to do was just that. She was not going to wait for First Nations leadership anymore to do this for us. Because part of the treaty relationship on our part is a treaty responsibility that we have, each and every one of us. So we took it upon ourselves, and she started there in Saskatchewan talking about these bills in community meetings that she called teach-ins, and she was the one who first started calling these community teach-ins idle no more. So I decided um, I'm home now, and I have a little bit of time and energy to focus on this stuff, and I take my treaty responsibility very seriously. Um, so I decided to have a teach-in here in Alberta. And that's kind of where it all started for me. And what I did and what I continue to do um, is go into meetings and communities and, and talk about the legislation. And the way that I discuss it is in a way that puts it in the context of a century-long effort of the Canadian government to finally get rid of the Indian problem. Their efforts to remove us from our lands have been going on since they arrived. And I see Bill C-45 as a continuation of that. And in 1969, uh, the Trudeau government put out the white paper. And that was, the idea was to assimilate First Nations people and get rid of the Indian problem. And as we know, um, the Indian Association of Alberta led the way in the fight against that in drafting Citizens Plus, which also became known as the Red Paper, and convincing the Trudeau government to shelf that, to, to do away with the White Paper. And they were successful in doing that. They put it away, and that was supposed to have been the end of it. But what it seems to me now, in looking at all of the legislation that we're facing as First Nations people, is that Stephen Harper took the white paper off the shelf, dusted it off, took sections out of it, modernized the wording, and put each and every one of them into different bills or aspects of it into different bills. So even though the white paper wasn't implemented in 1969 as a policy, I would say that it's on its way to being implemented now through all of these pieces of legislation. So this has been the driving force of Idle No More. Why it started was because all of these things were happening and nobody was talking to us about it. Nobody was. So it's also about taking accountability and responsibility for our own selves. Like each of us who've been involved in this, that's what it's been, an effort of trying to look to the future. And, and it always sounds kind of corny, I suppose, to say, but truly, Idle No More is inspired by feelings of such a profound love, not only for your people and your land, but in thinking ahead and having the same kind of mindset that my ancestors had in 1899. That you have to think ahead. What is going to be here for my grandchildren? What's going to be here for my great-grandchildren? And this has kind of been the consciousness and the awakening that Idle No More has brought. And it's been really easy for people 
in our communities to feel inspired by this because we've faced so many tragic times in our lives through the generations, the fallout from the residential schools, all of the impacts of the ongoing assimilation efforts of the Canadian state have been very violent against us, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and it always ends up in how it affects us physically, our health, our well-being, the suicides that plague our communities, the women and girls who go missing and murdered, all of these things. Idle No More has come to be inclusive and representative of all of those issues and our ongoing struggle to maintain our identity and take our identity so we can assume our rightful places in these lands that still belong to us. So the idea behind Idle No More for me, for Tanya Capo, has been about the relationship. The relationship with myself, the relationship of myself and my family, the relationship of myself and my community, and my relationship with Canada as a First Nations person. These are all very important. And we cannot think of one without thinking of the other if we're going to have any chance of having a sustainable identity. Because even though we can get together and make plans to resist government efforts and fight them and convince them in some way that what they're doing is wrong, what does that mean for us at home? How do we fix things in our communities so that we have a real chance? Sometimes when I think about some of the things that I've seen during my involvement in Idle No More, it's been very beautiful and also very dark. Some of the beauty of it coming out in flash mob round dances in the shopping malls in the sense of community and strength in places like Churchill Square or Parliament Hill where our people gather and just the whole exercise of gathering together, the energy and the strength that's there at that very moment is incredibly amazing. And I'll tell you, I've gotten so many emails and messages from people who I've never met who write to me and say, thank you for all of the efforts of Idle No More, because for the first time in my life, I'm not ashamed to be an Indian. And every time I read those words, I'm always really taken aback that some people still today feel such a shame in their Indianness that it's just, to me, really tragic. But that's, like I said, been part of the beauty of Idle No More, is giving that awakening. It's been very much a spiritual awakening, because I think people feel that, genuinely feel that, that this is about love. This is about our future. This isn't about fighting anyone. So some of the darkness that's come out of it, I think, that we continue to see has been the use of racist stereotypes of us as Indigenous people, about the non-accountability issue, um, all kinds of things. Many of our women who've been involved in Idle No More are facing issues of personal safety, like real physical safety questions. One woman in Thunder Bay, First Nations woman, was stolen off the street in Thunder Bay just after Christmas and she was taken out of town and brutally raped and beaten and left there for dead. And during the course of the assault, they told her that they didn't want Indians to have treaty rights. And more recently, there was a woman who received a death threat in the mail, an anonymous death threat in the mail, who the lady was and still continues to be um, an Idle No More organizer in Sault Ste. Marie. 
basically telling her if they see her at any more idle, no more events, she was going to get it. And in Vancouver last weekend, or the weekend before, sorry, there was an incident of a young First Nation woman who was beaten by a number of people because she was wearing a sweater that said Idle No More on it. So this is some of the darkness that we see emerging. But, but from that darkness, what's been able to happen through Idle No More is a kind of support and a sense of genuine community nationally, particularly amongst Indigenous people, because now we have social media, and social media has played a critical role in how Idle No More has been able to move as quickly as it has and to mobilize to the extent that it has so far. So now when we tell our stories on Facebook or on Twitter, people are paying attention and something happens right away. Whereas before, maybe nothing would have ever happened because nobody would have ever knew about it. So now people respond and what happens to one person happens to each and every one of us. And that's how we all react. And it really keeps one of the things going for Idle No More. That's one of the strengths, is this collective response and getting that sense of community back together. And I think also one of the most important things that I have seen also is There seems to be, for the first time, a genuine interest amongst Canadians to engage it with Indigenous people in a way that they haven't ever. And what that has meant that I've seen so far is the first step of regular Canadians wanting to be engaged with what's going on in Idle No More. And the first question they always ask is, what's this I don't know more stuff? And, and basically, what's these Indians doing now is usually the attitude. And, I, and they don't say it in a way that's meant to be condescending, but in a way that's genuinely, I want to know what's going on. So this great conversation has begun. And I think that the involvement of regular Canadians moving forward from here on in is very critical. Because for us to be able to achieve the kind of profound changes that we need, we need to have regular Canadians involved in this conversation with us. Because a lot of the barriers that we face aren't barriers that we put for there for ourselves. They're barriers that have been built to prevent us from moving ahead in any way. And I think that's also been one of my big concerns of all of the legislation that we're facing, is that they seem to be not even one step back, they're two steps back. Instead of making an opportunity for communities to be more in charge and in control and self-governing of their affairs, it seems to be giving that much more control back to the federal government. And if it's not to the federal government, then it seems to be efforts to remove the responsibility of Indians to the provincial government, which is known as offloading. And I think that concern of um, federal government and provincial government relations and how we relate to them is something that we need to start thinking about as well. So I think that one of the other things um, I, I just wanted to share briefly was a little bit of the time frame, the timeline on how Idle No More came to be. Because I know there's a lot of uh, people who ask, so what does Teresa Spence have to do with Idle No More? And how did you guys get involved with Teresa Spence? And, well, it, it didn't really happen that way at all. Um, it seems to be that the time was absolutely right for everything to happen how it happened. 
And I say that because everything was just this series of events that the timing of it seemed could only have been planned by the universe or by our ancestors because everyone was sort of doing their own thing, but it just so happened to be all at a time that the effects of each other's actions benefited each other's actions. For example, um, the National Day of Action was December the 10th. That was the first one across the country. And what had happened before, the week before that, was Bill C-45 went for its final vote in the House of Commons. And at the same time, it was also the first day for the Assembly of First Nations meeting in Ottawa. So uh, a lot of the chiefs who were in Ottawa already for the AFN meeting were suddenly like, what the heck? Bill C-45 is going for its last vote today. So they made the decision to shut down the assembly uh, that afternoon, and anyone who wanted to could go to Parliament Hill. And I'm not really sure what their intentions were at that point in time in, in going to try and address Bill C-45 just before its last vote was. But what ended up happening was it served as this sort of wind that fanned the embers that I don't know more was already like burning these little embers. And what happened was when our people started seeing these images of the, our chiefs on Parliament Hill, what looked like they were trying to bust the doors down and, you know, wrestle their way into the House of Commons. It really wasn't like that, but that was how it looked in the media. And of course, that's how the media portrayed it at first. But what that did was it brought to the attention very quickly Bill C-45. Suddenly, everybody's talking about it. And it seemed to me that the reason nobody was talking about it up until that point is because nobody really knew about it, for real. Because it was hidden, the changes in it were hidden in such an enormous piece of legislation, more than 400 pages long, not only were First Nations not aware of it, many Canadians were not aware of it. So the images on that day of them going into the House of Commons were all over the media, and our people became instantly mobilized. That was the wind, and suddenly these embers that were burning burst into these flames. And on the National Day of Action on December the 10th, there were events that happened from coast to coast to coast. The week before, when it all started to, the hype started to build about the National Day of Action, maybe there was only a handful of places across the country that were planning something. But by December the 9th, there was more than 20 all over the country. So on December the 10th, we have this massive show of Indigenous people and allies going out to talk against Bill C-45. And then what happened was something else completely unrelated, unplanned, in, in relation to I don't know more anyway, which was on December the 11th. The very next day, Chief Teresa Spence announces she's going on a hunger strike in Ottawa. Now the reasons for her hunger strike had to do with the relationship, the treaty relationship trying to bring attention to this very bad situation that First Nations people continue to live in, in their country. So her efforts were centered around that, wanting to push forward for a meaningful and a real genuine dialogue on the treaty relationship. So it doesn't sound much different than what Idle No More is kind of talking about in many ways. So it was very easy to support each other unofficially. You know, there was never any discussions to say, oh, let's support her, or her to say, oh, I'll support them, or anything like that. It just all happened, all for the same reason. Because we want and we deserve better than what we've had. And we're ready to do the work now, to get there. And, and that's what 
how Isle No More exploded onto the scene. When Teresa Spence announced her hunger strike, that was what made the fire become this explosion. Because suddenly, there's a life on the line now. And, and that was part of her messaging too, was that every day it's still very much a life and death situation for us. It's always a matter of survival. You know, it, it's not about living and enjoying life. It's about surviving. Um, am I going to get funded if I go to school next fall? Am I going to get a house any time in my lifetime? You know, these are life and death situations that we continue to live every day. And, and many of our young people are just choosing not even to do that anymore. And our rates of suicide are not only growing, but the age in which our children are making these decisions gets younger and younger and younger. And I just, I'm a mom. I have three kids. And when I think of 12-year-olds committing suicide and I look at my own kids and I just can't even imagine that situation for anyone. And, and this is how things got to be where they were for Idle No More the sense of seriousness, and like I said, this great feeling of love. Because I love my kids, I cannot let them face that any more than they already do. And my grandchildren, if I'm lucky enough to have grandchildren one day, what kind of a life will they be looking forward to? So that's just a little bit about what Idle No More is, how it came to be. And I'll just end with telling you a little bit about where things are at now and where things might be going. Much of the leadership hasn't been talking about the legislation. It's because they really didn't know it that well. And they're so bombarded with day-to-day -day business in First Nations communities that sometimes the legislation is not even on their agenda because they simply don't have the time. It has nothing to do with them not wanting to, but simply they are just unable to. So what's been happening in the last few weeks or so is, is recognizing that. And, and people still taking the responsibility to go out into communities and to different areas to bring forward this information, to share with community people. Because one of the other things is many of our communities don't have easy access to internet. And much of what's been happening with Idle No More happens through the social media on the internet. So in many instances, the education that we have to still continue to give our community members is extensive and outside in addition to the actual legislation itself. So, for example, last weekend I went to um, home, to my homelands, and I did an information session in Grand Prairie. I did one in Sucker Creek, and I did one in Sturgeon Lake. And I've also been really busy here in Edmonton um, at the invitation going to speak to various groups about Idle No More. And I've been very pleasantly surprised, like I said earlier as well, of the interest of regular Canadians to find out what Idle No More is about. I've been to speak to the Council of Canadians, the Edmonton chapter. They invited me to a meeting to speak, and it was packed. It was standing room only. And in there, there must have been only a handful of people that when I looked at them, I could tell they were First Nations people. So the majority of the people who came out for this event seemed to be the regular Canadians with a genuine interest in wanting to know about this. And I went to a United Church a couple of weeks back to speak to them at their invitation about what Idle No More is. And I think that 
not only do they want to know about it, the questions that they ask at the end are always, what can we do to help? So I think in moving forward for Idle No More, knowing that this kind of opportunity exists, an opportunity for dialogue amongst ourselves and within the country, we need to start thinking about what do we want to talk about? If Stephen Harper phoned us tomorrow and said, hey Indians, I'm going to live up to the treaty promises. Come and tell me what does it mean to you because I'm going to say yes. If he said that to us, what would we tell him? And I think that's what we really need to start spending time on, is thinking about what does that mean for us now? Because what we'll find is we have to have this big discussion about identity. Because our identities as an indigenous people are very much tied into our treaty relationship. And how does that work for sustainability? Well, it works wonders because it strengthens who we are as we move forward and, and makes a very strong beginning of sustainability for our grandchildren. So that's where Idle No More is at this point in time, the transition. What now? We continue to teach not only about the legislation, but about the history. It's been a real history lesson for many people, First Nations people and non-First Nations people, because it's definitely not the history lesson you get in school. It's the real truth about what happened to us and how it affected us. And when we talk about it that way, the reality can't be ignored or denied. And you'll find that, for the most part, the regular Canadians are very troubled to hear this and want to do something to help make a difference. So I'll end my... Um, conversation with you on that note and to let you know that Idle No More is really a grassroots movement and what that has meant has been that it belongs to the people in the sense of where it came from and where it's going to go is going to be up to the people who decide to put any efforts towards it. And how that might look is maybe the people in my home community, Sturgeon Lake, I go home, what does I don't know more mean to you if I want to ask them? And maybe they'll say, well, for us, it means we have a highway running right through our community. Maybe it means for us that one day we're going to do a traffic slowdown. And we're going to force every single person driving through our community to stop and have a conversation with us. And if they don't want to talk to us, then we're going to give them a pamphlet to, so they can look at it later. Because guess what? Even though maybe they just don't want anything to do with us, we, we, we would have pushed our way into their space a little bit because we stopped them. And we said, we want to talk to you about Idle No More. And even if they say, I don't want to know about it, it's too late. We already just talked to you about Idle No More. It's going to be in your mind now, right? So how people do their activities in their communities to advance things for themselves is up to them. A community meeting, a teach-in, a round dance, you know, what, whatever needs to be done to engage in a way that is very positive, full of love, and definitely on the legal side of things. So just wanted to end by thanking you again for inviting me here today and for listening to my story. Um, it's been quite the, quite the time in the last couple of months, and I feel a lot of excitement moving forward when I see people who are still really engaged and just waiting for what are we going to do next. Thank you.